Hi, my name is Kevin Ahern. I'm a professor of biochemistry and biophysics at Oregon State University, and it's my pleasure today to give this lecture about one of the most interesting and important proteins in the human body. That protein, of course, is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin we think of as the protein that carries oxygen from our uh, lungs, where the oxygen concentration is high, to the tissues where the oxygen concentration is lower. Hemoglobin is able to accomplish uh, the delivery of oxygen as needed to places in the body as a result of structure that it has. And before I talk about the hemoglobin structure and the role that its structure has in its function, I want to say just a few words about structure and function in general. Structure and function is something that we think about and we understand very clearly at the macroscopic level at which we exist. My hand, for example, has five fingers, it has a palm, it has bones, it has muscles, it has tendons, and it has nerve cells. And those structures within my hand allow my hand to perform the functions that it needs. Squeezing, holding, twisting, grasping, pinching, molding. Those functions are related to the structure that my hand has. Similarly, hemoglobin has a structure that determines the functions that it ultimately has. And I want to spend some time today talking about how those structures affect hemoglobin's function. Hemoglobin derives its name from the fact that it contains within it four individual subunit proteins called globins. Globins are encoded in the human genome. And we can see in this figure that there are four subunits. Two subunits known as alpha globins that are identical, and they're shown in red and two subunits that are identical, known as the beta globins, that are shown in blue. You notice also in the structure there's a central region that I'd like to call the donut hole that we will see is later important for hemoglobin's function. Each of the four individual subunits of a hemoglobin protein contains one uh, molecular structure we refer to as a heme group. That heme group, of course, gives hemoglobin part of its name. And that heme group has, it has a structure that is fairly flat and planar, like my hand. And the very middle of it contains an atom of iron. It's the iron atom within the heme that binds to oxygen and also releases oxygen when appropriate. Now, I've taken one of those uh, heme structures, and I've kind of zoomed in on in this figure to show you a little bit more about what's there. You can see the flattened nature of the heme molecule there. You can see the iron atom in the center of that. And you can see a bunch of other protein structures around that. Now, this figure, as you can see, is a little complicated. So I don't want to make too many points about it. But I will note that we're sort of looking at that heme structure angled on like this. What I would like to do is take that heme structure and look at it edge on so that we're looking at it from a fairly flat perspective and remove most of the other protein structures so that you have a better perspective of what the heme is doing in the bigger picture. And that's shown in this slide right here. We can see now that heme flattened structure that is actually a little bit uh, uh, concave uh, downwards, as you can see, has an iron atom in the middle. The iron atom is attached to a, an amino acid of the protein subunit, and that amino acid is known as histidine. Histidine is part of the polypeptide chain that makes up that subunit. And histidine is, of course, attached to the next amino acid, to the next amino acid, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through the chain. It's this linkage between the iron of the heme group and the histidine of the polypeptide chain that give hemoglobin some of the very important properties that it has. Now, what you see on the left is what we call deoxyhemoglobin, which is the state that this subunit would be in after it had delivered its oxygen to the tissues and was going back to the lungs to pick up more oxygen. In the lungs, the, the uh, subunit with the heme group encounters oxygen. And oxygen, which is shown here in the sort of pink structure, binds to the iron and causes a very small structural change in the heme group. The iron atom is moved upwards about 0.4 angstroms. This is a minuscule movement of the iron, but it has enormous consequences for the ability of hemoglobin to bind to oxygen and other subunits. So we can see here the binding. We see the movement of the, of the iron atom. And because the iron atom is attached to the histidine, the histidine correspondingly has also moved. 
the movement of the histidine is communicated through the entire chain of the rest of the polypeptide of that subunit. And we can imagine that the positions or the twisting or the turns and so forth of those other amino acids are all also slightly changed on the binding of the uh, oxygen by the iron of the heme group. Now, this very small structural change is absolutely critical for understanding what hemoglobin does. So the first message I have for you is that structure determines function. Okay? The structure of hemoglobin has built into it the ability to make small changes within itself, and those small changes affect the way that hemoglobin binds to oxygen and also releases oxygen. Let's take a look at it. Now, what I described to you earlier was for one subunit. What I would like to do now is schematically describe hemoglobin from a perspective of all four subunits and watch what happens on the binding of oxygen. Hemoglobin, after it dumps off all of its oxygen, will look like the structure shown on the left. We depict these as squares because these squares are what we use to indicate a lack of oxygen binding. This state I'll refer to later as, as the T state turns out to be a state that doesn't like to bind oxygen very readily. I'll repeat that. It doesn't bind oxygen very readily. So when this complex of four subunits makes it back to the lungs, the first oxygen binds only because there's a lot of oxygen in the lungs. One of those oxygens literally forces itself onto one of the subunits. Well, that forcing it on has a very important effect. I've already described to you how that structure changed slightly, and so I've used a circle here to indicate that structural change that happened to that first subunit. Because that first subunit interacted with the other subunits of the complex, we see that they start to change as well, and I've depicted that by a rounding of their corners. The more rounded the structure is in this figure, the more likely it is to bind to oxygen. Okay? So we see that the first oxygen went on with not very good efficiency, but the second oxygen went on with very good efficiency because it's binding to a rounded structure. The third went on very even more easily, and eventually a fourth bound as well. So what's happened is hemoglobin has changed from a square structure called the T-state to a round structure on the right known as the R-state. Now, I want to show you that at the level of what hemoglobin actually looks like. On the last figure, we saw that things changed from squares to circles, and that was a pretty dramatic change. In reality, the visual image that hemoglobin presents on that change is not quite so pronounced. There are changes. For example, we see some changes in this center part where we see more white over here and less white over here, and there's some rotations and things that happen, but it's not dramatically, uh, uh, it's not visually dramatic uh, to us as we look at it. The T state, I will remind you, is the state that didn't want to bind oxygen. In fact, what the T state wants to do is release oxygen. The R state, on the other hand, likes to bind oxygen, and what it prefers to do is to hold on to oxygen. Now, these two different structural states that hemoglobin exists in are essential to understanding how hemoglobin does what it does. And what we're going to see is that the change between these states is a function of the binding of molecules. You've already seen how the binding of oxygen converted hemoglobin from the T state to the R state. We're going to see other molecules that convert hemoglobin from the R state back to the T state. Well, before I talk about that, I want to say something about the oxygen binding properties of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin turns out to be great for the delivery of oxygen. Okay? I compare its oxygen binding properties here with that of another oxygen binding protein known as myoglobin. Myoglobin is found in our muscles, and it's really, really good at binding oxygen and holding on to oxygen, but it's not so good at letting it go. This is seen if we look at this plot. On the y-axis of this plot, we see what fraction of all the subunits are saturated with oxygen. Zero, meaning none of them are saturated with oxygen, and one indicating that 100% of the subunits are saturated with oxygen. If we look at this curve, we see that myoglobin gets saturated with oxygen pretty readily. It doesn't take very much oxygen 
to have that happen. However, hemoglobin isn't quite so good at getting or binding oxygen. It takes more oxygen to saturate hemoglobin. Well, fortunately, it turns out that in the concentrations of oxygen that we have in our body, hemoglobin turns out to work really well. In the concentration of oxygen in our lungs, for example, both hemoglobin and myoglobin are at 100%. So even though hemoglobin binds with less affinity, there's enough oxygen in our lungs to saturate hemoglobin. Hemoglobin gets 100%. If we look at the oxygen concentration that's in our tissues, however, we discover that myoglobin doesn't do a very good job of letting go of oxygen. At tissue concentrations of oxygen, myoglobin has only let go of 7%. And these are for cells that are really badly wanting oxygen. By contrast, at the same oxygen concentration, hemoglobin has let go of two-thirds of its oxygen. This release of all the oxygen by hemoglobin makes hemoglobin a really good protein for binding oxygen when it's, the concentration is high and releasing oxygen when the concentration is low. Now, it's important to understand the role of molecules in this process. Hemoglobin doesn't magically do that release that I just described to you with, in the absence of other things. There are molecules that affect hemoglobin's ability to release oxygen. The first of these is a molecule known as 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or 2,3-BPG. 2,3-BPG is produced by rapidly metabolizing cells. It's a byproduct of the metabolism of glucose. And cells that are rapidly metabolizing glucose, like muscle cells, for example, when they're exercising, will release a fair amount of 2,3-BPG. It's a small molecule. It's a simple molecule. And what 2,3-BPG does is it's able to bind into that donut hole of hemoglobin. Now, when 2,3-BPG binds to the donut hole of hemoglobin, it has a dramatic effect on that hemoglobin. It converts the hemoglobin from being in the R state to being in the T state. And the T state, you may recall, is a state that releases oxygen. It doesn't want to hold on to it. So when hemoglobin encounters a tissue that's rapidly metabolizing, it binds to the molecule that's being released by those cells and lets go of oxygen so those cells have the oxygen that they need. That's a really remarkable property. And it happens because the structure of hemoglobin is changing from the R state to the T state. Now, this is shown also in this graph that I, wanna, I, that I have on the screen here. This shows the oxygen binding properties of hemoglobin in the presence and absence of 2,3-BPG. There's no myoglobin on this figure. Looking at this figure, we see that when hemoglobin encounters tissues that are rapidly metabolizing and there's 2,3-BPG present, it gives up two-thirds of its oxygen, just as we saw before. And now we know where that two-thirds came from. It came from the fact that hemoglobin was encountering 2,3-BPG. By contrast, when hemoglobin encounters tissues that aren't producing 2,3-BPG, it releases only about 8% of its oxygen. Now, this is really important because hemoglobin is releasing oxygen where it's needed, and it's not releasing hardly any where it's not needed. Cells that aren't producing 2,3-BPG are not going through rapid metabolism and don't have as much oxygen needs as those that are going through rapid metabolism. Now, 2,3-BPG turns out to be interesting from another perspective. 2,3-BPG is produced in higher levels in the bloodstream of people who smoke. Smoking causes high levels of 2,3-BPG. Now, normally, 2,3-BPG binds to hemoglobin, and it's released from hemoglobin before the hemoglobin gets back to the lungs. And that's important because if 2,3-BPG is stuck to hemoglobin when it gets back to the lungs, then hemoglobin itself will be stuck in the T state and won't be able to flip into the R state. It won't be able to go through cooperativity and bind to oxygen. You can imagine now that the smoker who has a high bloodstream concentration of 2,3-BPG has it much more likely that their hemoglobin is going to make it back to the lungs, bound to 2,3-BPG, and be stuck in the T state. 
and as a consequence have a reduced oxygen carrying capacity compared to a person who's not smoking. It's one of the reasons people who smoke get out of breath easily as they're exercising. Now cellular metabolism, as we can imagine, varies throughout the body. I've already described muscle cells and being able for those rapidly metabolizing cells to signal hemoglobin what's going on is important. You've seen one of the um, molecules released by rapidly metabolizing cells. I want to describe two other things that are released by rapidly metabolizing cells that affect the structure and the function of hemoglobin. The first of these is a proton. Protons, of course, are uh, the part of acids that make them acids. When protons are released into a solution, they cause the pH of a solution to decrease. And rapidly metabolizing cells release a lot of protons. Consequently, the pH around rapidly metabolizing cells is lower than the pH of cells that aren't metabolizing so rapidly. Protons can also bind to hemoglobin. And while they don't make the dramatic change of T to R, they do favor the release of oxygen. And that's shown here. It's part of what we call the Bohr effect. Here we see the oxygen releasing properties of hemoglobin in the presence of 2,3-DPG by itself at a normal physiological pH. And we see the drop of 2 thirds of the oxygens by the uh, hemoglobin. When we take that same hemoglobin and 2,3-DPG and we put it into a lower pH solution, we see that not two-thirds, but over three-quarters of the oxygens are released, indicating that the lower pH is affecting the structure of hemoglobin and favoring the release of oxygen. A third molecule that's released by rapidly metabolizing cells is one that we all pretty much know of, and that's carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is produced by cells as a product of aerobic oxidative metabolism. Carbon dioxide is a poison. If carbon dioxide accumulates, it will kill cells. So our body has to have a way to dispose of carbon dioxide. And one of the ways in which our body does it is by the binding of carbon dioxide by hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a pretty amazing protein. The binding of carbon dioxide by hemoglobin also affects the, the shape, the structure of hemoglobin, and its ability to bind to oxygen. So now I showed you the last graph that had the top two bars here. If I take the experiment of the last two uh, bars and I add carbon dioxide to it, I discover that instead of releasing three quarters of the oxygen, the hemoglobin releases about 90% of its oxygen, meaning that the binding of carbon dioxide by hemoglobin with protons and with 2,3-BPG has an additive effect and causes additional oxygen to be released. These molecules will be in greatest abundance where cells are going through rapid metabolism. What I've told you, therefore, I want to summarize here. First, I hope I've made the point that structure determines function. The structure that's built into hemoglobin allows it to bind more oxygen when it encounters oxygen and to release more oxygen when it encounters cells that are going through rapid metabolism. Hemoglobin does that as a result of binding to molecules that are signaled by rapidly metabolizing cells. This includes 2,3-BPG, protons, and carbon dioxide. Hemoglobin binds to these molecules, and as a result of binding to these molecules, has its shape slightly changed in very subtle ways but the, the result of that slight change is enormous. Considerable oxygen is released as a result of that, and cells that therefore need that oxygen get it. As a consequence of this, hemoglobin is able to provide the body with its physiological needs for oxygen. I thank you for your attention. I hope this has been helpful to you. I wish you the best.